Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you once again for coming. My name is Jersey Drozd. Uh, many of you here know who I am because uh, I work with your kids a lot. Uh, I am a cartoonist, that is to say, a person who makes comic books. Uh, it doesn't mean I'm a comedian. Uh, and uh, I also teach here at the Ann Arbor District Library and at the Ann Arbor Arts Center and a whole bunch of places around the you know, Brighton, uh, Celine. And over the last five years, working with all these young people, I have met some bright, shining stars in the area who clearly show the dedication, the passion, and the ethic needed to be a professional cartoonist before they're even 18 years old. And so thankfully, and I have to thank the Ann Arbor District Library for this, uh, thankfully they uh, were happy to host a discussion with these people because I think that they have a wisdom that would be useful not only to other young people getting started in cartooning, but also to a lot of us working professionals. I know I've learned a lot from these guys. So now I will introduce them. Uh, to my immediate left, uh, first on your left, I think, would be uh, Snow. Snow is taking one of my classes right now at the Ann Arbor Art Center, uh, Graphic Novel Academy. And Snow, I don't know if you wanted to introduce everybody to your work. You can hold up some of the stuff that you're working on and tell us about it a little bit. Well, I've been, since I was really young, like six or something, I've played a, a, a game, where we, a talking game back and forth, where we would make up a story. And we, and we made up a lot of characters that we that I've stuck with for a long time and I've tried writing a book I've tried pretty much any everything just to write down my ideas and comics was pretty much the only way I could actually get what was going through my mind on paper for other people to enjoy I've been starting to work on one I've only started this recently so um, it's not very far done but could you tell us a little bit about the general idea of what the story is about that you've been building? By the way, we should say you built the story with your brother, uh, Daniel, right? Yes, uh, we built the characters together. We pretty You're much getting tighter on the mic. Oh, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> we pretty much um, build the characters together, or at least a lot of them. A lot of each of us have our own version of the game that we play on our own, a more of a personal version, and that's pretty much what I write about. We do talk back and forth and do a mixture of the two, which is to this day called Adventure Games. <laughs> <laughs> That's straightforward. And so it, it, what happens in Adventure Games? What kind of characters do we see in there? Well, you see Barley, who is a commander of a group of kids who have superpowers. She's from a different dimension that is, was destroyed and she's wor she works to protect all other dimensions because of that fact. She's very independent, but really, in but really does accept and want other people's opinions, and just, I don't know. <laughs> there's a couple of foils in your story, too. There's a, there's a pair of opposites that kind of bang against each other personality-wise, right? Could you tell us about just, a, little, just what, a sentence or two about each of them? Well, there's Pyra, and she's got fire powers. She is really bouncy. She's got a lot of energy and doesn't really think about anything until she, after she's done it. And then there's Hale, who has ice abilities, and he's very calm and collected, and they can't stand each other. But yet they have to work together. This barley's keeping them together. Well, mm -hmm. cool. Well, we're going to talk more about like, this, this talking game to make characters in a little bit. So that, that's a really interesting idea about a way to build stories. Uh, my first comic, one of my first comics came out of doing a role-playing game that I do with my friends, right? You know, the, the, the Dungeons and Dragons kind of stuff. Okay, so next I want to introduce Olivia. Olivia is, uh, gosh, you've been part of the Comic Book Academy now for a couple years running uh, that we hold Maybe. here at the library? Maybe one or two. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, but you've, taken your com you've, you've completed a couple comics through these classes here at the library, but then you've taken it to the next level. You also produce a whole bunch of different kinds of art, uh, graphic art. Do you want to hold up some of your stuff and tell us about uh, yeah. it? Yeah, so, um, well, I haven't really finished this one yet, but this one was one that I think I made before I started the library program, and it's called Nutty. And so I haven't really colored it or anything yet, so it's just... Did you bind that yourself? Hmm? Yeah. Oh, neat. So, yeah, and then... I made, I've completed this comic book called, it's called Hopelessly Clueless, and it's about this rabbit who avoids death by inches and is really careless. And so then 
I really like doing crafts, so I go to like every single library activity. So I make like stuff, and then sometimes I sell it, and that is clear. Well, the hopelessly clueless one, that is one I remember you working on mm -hmm. at the Academy. I wonder if you could hold up a couple of the pages that you did in there, because that, that was one where I remember you were playing around with a lot of different tools that you hadn't been using previously, right? Yeah. Like drawing tools. Like what, what was, uh, there was a certain kind of pen that you kind of... Oh, yeah. Yeah. I got this, uh, Jersey brought in these writing utensils and to help us ink our work. And so I really, really liked this one. It's called a brush pen. And it's sort of like a brush, but a pen. Heads <laughs> 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 the day, right? Yeah. But yeah, yeah, it's a Pentel color brush pen where it's got like this uh, ink well that you just, uh, you can squeeze it to charge up the brush and you don't have to clean the brush afterwards. Yeah. What did you Jerry's. like about it so much? Because I remember you, you, that was, you were one of the few kids in the class who really took to that. Yeah, well, I liked it because it's really good for drawing little details like fur and patterns and stuff like that. And it's sort of like a paintbrush, and it's easier to, like, just make really fluid lines. Yeah, so fluid lines is, uh, helps, it helps your drawings look a little bit more professional, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, as, as opposed to, like, well, although a wobbly line could be effective for certain kinds of storytelling, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll talk more about yours in a second. Next, I want to introduce Natalia. Now, Natalia, we met at Kids Read Comics. Uh, well, you, you attended Kids Read Comics, I think, what, a year ago? That, that's when we first met you, was in Dearborn at Kids Read Comics 2010, and you met Ryan Estrada, another Michigan cartoonist. And uh, then Ryan said to us at Kids Read Comics, we gotta get this kid to come to next year's show and actually table at the show because he was so impressed by how much work you had completed and so you did, you and Olivia both were uh, guests at uh, last year's show in Chelsea, Michigan, uh, selling your comics there. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about some of the comics ca characters that you've created over the years, because you've got a ton of them. Well, um, this is one of my earliest comics that I called Four Twin Jays. Um, there are these quadruplets. Uh, all their names start with J, apparently. <laughs> And they um, are just just about to start fourth grade, but these really weird mishaps start to happen to them, and it ends up in total chaos. So what, what, what happens that makes it total chaos? Well, since this is one of my earliest comics, it was really weird. How so? Okay, like what, so what? these normal fourth grade girls become these weird super ninjas. <laughs> <laughs> and then what do they do? And they have to fight off these other weird super ninjas that also happen to be normal people. <laughs> and they somehow have to win this fight and just get on with the day. <laughs> So you like to write a lot of funny stories. I know that one of you, the two things I, I, you've talked to me most about uh, in terms of comics that you enjoy are Sonic, Sonic the Hedgehog. Are you still reading that? Yeah. And uh, Pokemon. And both those stories have a lot of action and a lot of comedy, right? So uh, tell us about Pattern, because Pattern's another one of your big characters, and that's another funny story that you write. Well, Pattern is sort of based on Garfield. He's not fat and lazy, though. He likes just causing trouble wherever he can find it. The second his owner leaves the house, he starts clawing the couch, opening the refrigerator, and knocking all the ice cubes out of the freezer, throwing the trash in the most expensive kind of thingies, I don't know what, and cl clawing random people on the street. Wow like waiting for the bus or something. And then you finished another one on the way here today. Just on the way into the, the, the panel, you finished another mini comic. I, I got an idea to start this about two days ago or something. And this is my first book of it. I call it Blob. It's about this little blob that goes on these tiny, weird adventures. All he can say, though, is blob. So I'm thinking about making 
a little guide that goes with these books that tell exactly what Blob is saying. <laughs> like a translation index? So but what you've, done, you've, you've translated some of his balloons in there, because you were showing me a balloon where he says Blob, and then you, in the, the drawing you draw a guy named Jack and then a pot to say, show that he's saying jackpot. So like you show symbols to show what he actually means, right? Yep. That was uh, only in some of them. So this is how Blob says, time to dance. He goes, Blob. This is what Blob says, it's time to eat dinner. Blob. <laughs> this is what Blob, this is what Blob says when he's trying to put a lamp in the toilet. Well, he doesn't say much. <laughs> Well, awesome. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, and next we have Caleb. Caleb is another student in uh, one of my classes at the Ann Arbor Arts Center, and uh, you are both a cartoonist and a programmer, yes? Yeah. So yeah. What, what, are you, what are you programming? Because I, I, I see you talking about it all the time. Um, I've been working on basically various small projects. Um, what I was working on most recently was just a sprite engine so I could, could draw. 2D pictures on a screen and move them around. Oh, is this for a storytelling project? To, to create? We should explain what sprites are for those who haven't heard the term. Sprites are basically um, objects on a screen and just a way of drawing a picture in a rectangle. It's, it's like a pixelated kind yeah. of illustration style that you've yeah. seen a lot of video games. Anybody here who's ever played Super Mario Brothers, you've seen sprites, right? Yeah. Every different animated cell of, of Mario moving on the screen is a sprite. Yeah. yeah. So and, and it, there are a lot of popular comics that work in that style, too, right? Like Diesel yeah. Sweeties is one that works in that style. Uh, I can think of also, um, I don't know if 8-Bit Theater is still playing. I don't know if you've read those ones. But, but anyway, so, okay, but then you also make comics. What are you yeah. working on right now? Um, so... I'm in your class. We are all working on an anthology of Rainbow Buddies, which we came up with last class. Um, and I have all of this so far. Um, my story is there are, there's a world set about 400 years after a nuclear war, and um, civilizations have grown back up at varying stages, and each um, each nation is based off a of color. Um, and the main problem of the story is all of the ruined land surrounding the inhabitable areas is starting to spread and is damaging important pieces of all of their lifestyles and a few individuals from each city travels out and tries to find a way to stop it. So this is a man versus uh, nature story and we were talking about that in class with different kinds of stories and you decided that your antagonist was going to be the environment itself, right? Yeah. Uh, and just to bring people to speed when he talks about the Rainbow Buddies, one of the things we're doing, both Snow and Caleb are uh, undergoing an experiment in my class where I present them with a fictional uh, intellectual property that they are all freelance illustrators working to create a story based on this intellectual property. And it, Caleb was in the class where we decided, well, what are we going to call it? And we said, oh, Rainbow Buddies, that's silly. And uh, I think there's, what, seven or eight kids in this class? And it ranges from comedy to horror to post-apocalyptic doom quest, and then uh, Snow's yours is like a futuristic fantasy. You know, it's, it's really interesting to see all the different students' takes on trying to uh, create a story within the constraints of calling it Rainbow Buddies and having to incorporate primary colors as a storytelling element. It's, yeah. it's really fun to watch this thing come together. Okay, so now I've I got some questions for the entire panel that I'm hoping you guys can all weigh in on. You guys all think really hard about what you do, uh, even when you're not aware of it, right? I'm sure you've had experiences where just like, I don't know where the idea came from, it just happened. But then there's also days where you look at something that you did, and you're like, oh, that's pretty nice. Like for instance, Snow has this page right here, I don't know if you can hold it up, and I don't know if it's gonna show up on camera or not, this one right here, where you brutalized yourself by drawing some one point perspective shots of infinite rows of lockers. And how long did that take? Hours, all day. <laughs> you're not, you, my point is that you're not afraid to walk away 
or I mean, you won't walk away from a challenge on the page is what I'm trying to say. And so you guys, you guys put your backs into this. I'm curious if I work with a lot of adults as well. And strangely enough, adults are twice as terrified to draw comics than young people are. Uh, they, adults always say to us, oh, you do comics, that's cute, that's fun. What, what are you going to do for a living, though? And then you put a pencil in their hand and say, hey, draw something for me. And they're like, whoa, hey, no, I can't even draw a straight line, right? Uh, what advice would you give them if, if they expressed an interest to say, hey, I might want to take a comics class and do what you guys do. Do you have any kind of advice that you'd say to them, like, here's what to expect, here's what you should worry about, here is what the worthwhile challenge in making comics? Who wants to tackle that one? Um, one thing I would recommend doing is read a few comics beforehand. Why? Um, well, for instance, about a week ago, um, I've noticed that my pages were actually considerably worse than they have been today, um, which might be because I've read an entire comic series throughout the past week. Which one were you reading? Dr. McNinja. Oh, Dr. McNinja by Christopher Hastings. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. a fantastic online comic and in print. And what was it that, that you picked up from reading that comic? Do you remember? Um, well, one thing, I have started looking a lot more at all the panel layouts in the different comics I've read. And um, my panels seem like I've got tons of really huge panels, and I can't get enough to happen on a page. Oh, man. Like, enough to happen, like, fitting. To, to move the story forward. Because you're telling it in still images, right? Yeah. And in an animation, if you want to show somebody wind up and punch somebody, you, know, you can do all that. But in a comic, you've got to figure out what's the moment that you pick, right? Yeah. But then also you talk about layout. What do you mean by yeah. layout? Because that, that's kind of a weird concept to people who are unfamiliar with how comics work. Um, so this page, this page here um, started out like this. And if you hold it up a little I, bit more towards the back of the video, thanks. I had to decide a few things about this. Um, so this is the, the character in this page is John. Um, he ended up crashing his hot air balloon, and so he has to walk like 50 miles back to the city. Um, so basically, I started out with a really wide panel um, because he's walking a long way. And then I ran into some trouble down below because I wanted to have a really tall panel for when he's being lifted back up into the city. But I couldn't get that to fit in with the other panels on the page and make it easy to read. Um, and eventually I um, so on here, I just have one panel leaving a gigantic open space. And on my final page, I do have a second um, narrower panel stuck in so that it's still obviously before the That's it, That's interesting that you're struggling with that. That's something that I think a lot of cartoonists struggle with, is trying to capture movement. But then there's there's side to side movement, there's up and down movement. And if you have a panel that's a very wide and shallow panel, how do you show something moving up, right? And, and fit it within the context. So, so layout, correct me if I'm wrong, Caleb, are you saying that it's arranging the panels so that they work together in a and, composition on the page? And so that you can still read it in the right order without spending five minutes on a page. Right, Which right. Which I have had to do in a few comics. Yeah, oh, with, uh, with comics that you've made or comics that other Comics that, you, that I've read. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in the, in the 60s, they used to put little arrows pointing where to go next uh, as a cheat because yeah, not everybody yeah. understood good panning. So you look like you had something to offer on this. Do you struggle with this layout business, mm. this composition stuff? Or? I think the most, uh, the, mo the most problem I have is not making all the panels look the same. What do you mean? Like, if you have a bunch, I don't like just putting a bunch of squares on a piece of paper. I have I don't know why. I just don't feel happy with it unless it has some, at least one bizarrely shaped panel on it. Hmm. Why would you make your panels different shapes? Can you offer anything on that? Well, a bigger panel more can fit into it, but also a bigger panel could declare more emphasis. Mm. So it, it depends on what you want emphasis on. 
And if all the panels are the same shape and size, then there's no emphasis on anything. Right, like if it's like, it's like a grid of blue squares, it's like a grid of blue squares, but then if one of them's huge, it's like, oh, that must be the important one, right? Mm -hmm. um, you talked, just before we started doing this panel, uh, about flow and some problems that you ran into with flow in your story. And, and I asked you to, to define this because I thought that was a really, it's interesting how you think about, again, correct me if I'm wrong here, you think about story flow as being both a visual and a narrative thing, right? Like the pictures are telling the story. So what were you struggling with? Could you describe the, the, the conflict that you had in developing your story? Well, I wanted to start with a scene inside a refrigerator just because I thought it would be fun to draw the food. <laughs> <laughs> How many here on the panel actually decide to start a panel because it would be a fun thing to draw? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's just, well, that would be cool, <laughs> right? That's a perfectly good reason to start a panel like that, so go ahead. But it didn't really work. It didn't feel right. You c I could get it from one place to another, but it wasn't a smooth transition. You started somewhere, and it didn't make sense very easily without a lot of filler to get to another place. So I ended up with a classroom door, and the refrigerator scene will have to be a notebook project. <laughs> So, yeah, you decided that you, there would be too much of a stretch between going from a refrigerator in somebody's house to a school. Mm -hmm. That'd be kind of a weird transition, wouldn't it? Right? It's like, oh, I'm on the bus and I'm eating a taco. Now I'm on a surfboard. Right? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what we might call clunky storytelling, unless you're doing it for effect, right? So it's, it's cool that you have to think about that. It's not just about drawing a bunch of pictures in a row. You have to think about how you compose a story, right? You have to be a writer, too, don't you? Yeah. So, and it helps that you probably, I'm guessing, you've probably done some writing on your own in the past. Yeah, I've done several mini books that didn't get any farther than scrap, but... It's still writing, right? That counts as pages. Uh, is there any advice that you would give to somebody who's new to making comics to help them get started? Not really, except for you should know your character. Your character should feel real to you. It's no fun if you've got a piece of paper that's nothing but a piece of paper with a person that moves around on it. You need to know your character. How do you get to know them? When you make up a full story, even though you won't be saying it, like, in this character, I have a character named Mer. She usually goes around with an enormous Great Dane. She's really, and she really depends on him. And um, just knowing about her tendency to rely on people adds to her nervousness in this comic with the absence of her dog and mm -hmm. the absence of anyone above her to help her, or above her in experi experience to know what to do just knowing different traits that other people would just think she's nervous, but I know a little deeper that she's nervous because she doesn't have anyone higher up to, to help her along. When, when you're getting to know your character, are you writing it? Or are you keeping like a journal, like, oh, here's some things I think about when I think about this character, or is it happening just in your head? Is it happening in discussions? I mean, could you describe that? Well, here's a question for you. When you're making a friend, do you write down in a journal every time you know something new about that friend? Check and checkmate. That is a wonderful counter argument. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. No, I don't. I don't. But I think about it a lot, right? Like, why did he say that funny thing to me? Or, like, why did that strike me as so funny, right? Sometimes you'll just get... When you play games with yourself, you'll find yourself thinking funny but relevant things about your character. And then you have to think of a way to make it fit into their personality and history. Yeah. So it's like, it's also just collecting things that are just funny to you too, right? So you probably have to have a pretty good memory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so take, uh, use memory training games like the Nintendo Brain Age kind of stuff, I guess. It's the only thing I can remember. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in other subjects, maybe you don't excel so well with, with uh, memory, but yeah. with this you do? Yeah. It's more interesting, isn't it? To make up your own stuff. Uh, I want to hear from Olivia and Natalia. Like, is there anything you guys would say to somebody who's like, ooh, ooh, comics, I'm scared. This is really dangerous stuff. I don't know if I want to do it. What would you say to them? What advice would you give them? Um, I'd say to try a bunch of different, like, drawing techniques. Like, the other, like, a couple months ago, I tried drawing manga, like, based on the books that I read, because I usually just draw either really realistic or really cartoony. So then... That's how I got started on the Hopelessly Clueless, because I liked the idea of the animals with the big eyes. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got like, started on this book. So that's what I'd say. Try a bunch of different ways to draw. So you don't feel locked into one art style, like, yeah. this is who I am. 
Yeah. And this is what you can expect from me every time, right? So a little bit of uh, experimentation, mm -hmm. playfulness. So, I mean, and it worked out for you with Hopelessly Clueless. What, what, what were you, uh, was, is it that, what you got on the table in front of you that you were reading that inspired you to try out the oh, manga style? Yeah, it, well, one of them. It's a book called Yotsuba And, and it's about this girl who is extremely, like, really immature, sort of. And she's kind of, she doesn't really know anything about, like, the real world. And she is always new, reading and learning new things every day and having new experiences and she looks kind of cute. So it, that's why I kind of liked it. So it made me want to draw some of that kind it's of She's style. like this, this cheerfully innocent person who's amazed by everything around her, right? And that yeah. gets into trouble. <laughs> so uh, what I saw something else underneath it that I oh. think this is kind of a cool juxtaposition. Oh yeah, this is um, the Archie comics and it's like sort of a realistic but not extremely realistic comic book about like this these two girls and a boy who are kind of like love triangle sort of but it's kind of funny well really funny actually and but it's realistic pictures and so that's what got me like one of the things that got me on realistic drawing and cartooning like mixed together i think that that's actually a really really smart thing to consider is that having an understanding that you're not locked into drawing it one way so if it doesn't work out for you what do you do um, well, I would just maybe try another one. <laughs> yeah, just move on to something else, right? Yeah. I mean, there's so many different art styles. Like, most people, when they think of comic books, they think of superheroes. But yeah. who here on the panel has ever read, like, a superhero comic seriously? Like, collected it religiously? Yeah, I mean, because there's lots of other kinds out there, isn't there? You know, it's like, like I wonder if, we, um, I want to get Natalia's take on any advice that you might have for any grown-ups to make comics, and then I want to move on to talking about what books that you guys read. I'd say start with a scribble, then keep adding on to that scribble until it becomes a character. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. That is exactly what cartooning is, isn't it? It's scribbling, but with like, like, real, like serious focus and, and uh, dedication, isn't it? So is that how you've discovered a lot of your characters? Mm, kind of. Where do your characters come from? books I read and sometimes even computer games. Like what computer games? Well, there's something called Test Subject Blue and Test Subject Green. That's where I got my blob idea from. They're both two little blobs that just really don't like each other. And it shows you have to um, just get, that's, well, okay, I don't know how to explain this. <laughs> <laughs> um, it just really sparked me that a blob isn't really used for any kind of comic idea because it's just a blob. But I also have a comic called Crumb, and he's just a tiny little fuzzy thing. I, also, I like bringing little tiny things to life and showing their point of view. And, that, and the test subject in blue and green, those two blobs that didn't seem like much, made me think, Hmm, what could those blobs actually do if they were, if they had, like, human life? Yeah, personification, right? Just, like, <laughs> looking at something and saying, neat. And then I wonder what kind of personality that thing would have, right? Well, that's cool. Okay, I want to talk to you guys about, like, what books you're reading and where you get your inspiration from. And here's the thing. It doesn't have to be comics, okay? Because I'm, the other thing that I notice is a common trait between all of you is that you consume your media a whole bunch of different ways. You play video games, you read lots of books. Uh, Snow, we had a long conversation about Chronicles of Narnia and C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy in class, you know, showing that you've, you've read a few, more than a couple books, right? Um, so what, I wonder if you guys could sound off on what are the things that uh, really inspire you, make you say, I want to do that, and what was it about that that made you say, I want to do that thing? I want to do something. I want to make people feel just like how I felt when I read this or played this or watched this. No, you want to go first? Well, books and comics and video games and cartoons and movies and everything all have their own feel. And each one is unique. So it's pretty much just... When you look at that, you understand that there's more than just one solid way. A cartoon has to make you feel happy. A, curl, a cartoon is, has to be a, a more realistic thing, has to be very, like, 
It has to be more of a make you think sort of comic. That's not how it's supposed to be. I don't think there's anything much funnier than a very realistic comic you would think would not be very funny and comical being the most hilarious thing you've ever read. You're talking about like irony, right? Mm -hmm. Like doing something like completely unexpected by having, right, like uh, a well rendered, very realistic looking comic and then some really ridiculous thing, like not even like pie in the face humor, but like something fantastical suddenly happens, right? That kind of comparison. Yeah. So but what, what's one of the things that, do, do you have something like a book or a movie, cartoon, comic, anything that then inspired you to say, I want to do this comic stuff? Um, not really. Like I said, comics was just the only thing that worked. I tried pretty much everything. I tried writing, I tried flip notes, I tried hand-drawn animation. Comic books were the only thing that worked. But I, really, I like reading the Sonic the Hedgehog comics. And I go, I go to those to get a lot of paneling help, just to see how they paneled it out. So I guess that's pretty much inspiration on that type. But I really like the Hayao Miyazaki's films, all of them. Mm -hmm. Spirited Away, Castle in the Sky, all those have amazing artwork. They may not seem very connected to manga. I mean, not manga, but um, comic books. But um, art is art. If you can make a character mo walk around on a screen, you can make a character walk down a hallway in frames. Nicely said. Very nicely said. Uh, in, in Miyazaki's films, uh, he does a lot of stuff where he just looks at something, right? Like, like in, uh, you've seen My Neighbor Totoro, right? Unfortunately not. Oh, right. Okay, what about, let's talk about Spirited Away. Uh, she's on that train for a long time, and there's a lot of t scenes where, uh, what, what's, what's her name in the film again? Um, I can't remember her name. The, the main character. She's sitting on a train, and then he just shows all these scenes of we're looking out the window of the train. We're looking inside the train. Uh, we're you know looking at the water that's covering the train tracks. He does that a lot, and uh, I wonder do, does does that stand out to you at all? Like in like his moment choices and how he will hang and rest on something for a little while. Yes, it definitely. You could easily turn that one that movie in Pacific specific could definitely be turned into a comic book instantly just because there's so many resting points yeah it in, it's a well although it is important to keep things flowing in a comic book it's a lot easier to play the pauses yeah <laughs> it certainly is because it is a, it's a still medium right but it's but when you actually are going in a fast-paced world and you have found a way to get going on such a thing like panels where someone's running down a hallway it can be hard to transition between the two yeah for sure and that's where you have to play around a lot with like panel size or something like that in order to get that across yeah mm -hmm. okay cool uh, Olivia what do you got for like something that just probably what you just talked about yeah. huh yeah. Uh, any anything else? Any other comics or books that you think like, oh man, this is like if you if you love comics and you want to get into this medium, this would be the one I'd recommend to get you so inspired that you have to. Or or a book or a film or a cartoon, anything. What do you got? Um. Well, I really I enjoy the Bone series because it has like these really simple characters, but then it has these great landscapes and details and stuff like that. And so it shows you that you can do like really simple things and it'll still be a good comic. Mm -hmm. And then I also like the Flight series where they have all the different little comics in one because there's so many different like styles and opinions and stories and you can read it all in like one book. Yeah, it's an anthology series mm -hmm. where it has sort of like, has anybody here not read Flight, not heard of it? Okay, yeah, it's, it's, it's a graphic novel uh, anthology collection by Kazuki Buishi. He edits it, and, and uh, a lot of, actually some people who have been here at the library have been in Flight. Uh, Ryan Estrada, again, was in the Flight, uh, Flight Volume 4, I think. Uh, and it just has this theme of something that feels uplifting and, like, positive, right? But that's the only limitation put on the story. So you get this wide variety of beautiful storytelling styles. All the stories are really nice looking. Uh, and sometimes they're wordless, sometimes they have text, you know, sometimes they're funny, sometimes they're a little bit more dramatic. So you like that variety. Again, you come back to that the variety of styles that appeals yeah. to you. Oh, cool. Um, what, about, what about a book that inspired you to, like, tell stories? Anything like that? Well, I really enjoy fantasy books, but I haven't really written any fantasy comics yet, so I'm planning to do so. 
But I really enjoy um, books by Patricia C. Reed. They're all about, like, dragons and queens, but not in a way that you'd think they'd be. They're not, like, all princessy and stuff, and they kind of make fun of that. So it's a pretty good series. One of those series is pretty good. So that's what inspired me. Okay, cool. Natalia, what do you got? What, what inspires you? What makes you want to get to the drawing board right now? Well, if I read a new comic book, I take in the style immediately to test it out, and I grab the nearest paper I can and start testing out the style to see if that could become one of my most main styles. Um, I like reading the Pokemon comic books, Sonic the Hedgehog comic books, Garfield comic books, and lots of others. Um, what about book books, though? I mean, you also breeze through books all the time. Yeah, there's a new series. I just started reading the Warriors series. What, and the cool thing is how I found about found out about the Warriors series and how I decided I wanted to start reading it. I was at a library and my mom found these Warriors comic books. Oh yeah, I've seen those. How are they? Are they any good? Oh, they're awesome. I've read it, all of them. And that really sparked me to make um, stories about the warriors themselves. I like doing lots of fan art. Okay. I make pictures of Pokemon, warriors, Sonic the Hedgehog, etc. And it's also inspired me to try <coughs> new types of drawing styles because I usually just stick to one kind of style. Okay, so yeah, so again, you know, discovering new books means that it means you're going to find a style where I want to try that, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, Caleb? Well, I like to do stuff. Like, I do animation, 3D modeling, um, programming. I've now obviously been doing cartooning. I like trying to make things. Um, when I started drawing comics basically because we saw the class um, and then what's inspired most of my comics have been things that you've recommended to me oh. like Dresden Kodak and Dr. McNinja. Dresden Kodak, like Dr. McNinja, both very wildly funny and smart comics, right? Uh, could you describe like Dresden Kodak to the, because to, I'm, I'm sure nobody here, has anybody here read that? It's a webcomic. I mean, that's another thing. Yeah. You read webcomics, which I didn't web hear comics. from anybody else yet. So, um, Dresden Kodak is basically um, a comic about this girl who does lots of absurd science stuff, like, um, and it has lots of humor that's based off um, following science. So far, to like the Earth gets invaded by a bunch of robots that time traveled using physics that's accepted so far. So it's like, like the Thinking Man science fiction comedy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's beautifully drawn too. Yeah. I mean, Aaron Diaz he has a very like a, like a painterly kind of style, which yeah. is another kind of style that you don't think of traditionally when you think of comics, right? It's like there's no lines around his figures. He just paints the colors on, and he paints digitally. Yeah. But yeah. But so you you mentioned like a, a you like to make things. Let me ask the whole group. Do you think that it's necessary to have a, a disposition to like to make things in order to do this? Because uh, again, let's talk about how much time it takes to do this stuff. Who here spent more than four hours on a page? Single on, page. on a panel, on a single page, right? Mm, yeah. So, well, including coloring and stuff. <laughs> I'm talking soup to nuts, the blank page, finished color page. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, it's a time consuming thing. So, I mean, do you guys, would you guys, who wants to weigh in on this? Do you think that you have to have a natural disposition to want to make things? Or do you think this is something that you can pick up after a while? Like, you do it just for fun and eventually you get hooked on it, or, you know, or just do it casually? Yeah. What do you guys think? Who wants to weigh in? Well, um, <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I should have called the name. Uh, how about Olivia, you go first, then okay. Snow. So I think that you should, well, you can pick it up like after trying it for a while, but you should be able to 
at least follow through with a character design or something so that you can actually begin making stuff because if you want to make stuff, then you should make stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. There's so many, so many bite-sized nuggets of wisdom coming off this panel today. That's great. Snow, what do you think? Um, I think that the knack to make stuff is the want and interest to display what you want to show. And if comic books is the right thing for you, you'll find out. It'll feel right. And you can just do it for fun. You don't have to do any everything and anything professionally. I think that's a nice way of thinking about it, yeah. Okay, well let's talk about um, going from this hard work stuff to talk about in a spirit of play, because I want to talk about how you and Daniel Snow, how you guys made your story. You, you did it by playing this talking game. Could you describe what this is? What's, what do you mean by a talking game? Um, well, he throws out an idea, and I come back at it. We come up with insane stories from basic ideas, like them being trapped, them make, trying to make an underwater base and finding that the cave they are trying to build in is already occupied, sort of thing. Uh -huh. And then it, it started like that, but then it got bigger and bigger and bigger to, you could probably watch what we talk about as a movie, and accept it as realistic enough. It's very realistic. We talk everything out, and whenever we have a new science idea, we make sure it fits scientifically, and we argue with each other as, almost as much as we play, just because we make it so realistic. Didn't used to be like that. But now <laughs> <laughs> it, it, each year it gets more and more deadly serious. Yes. <laughs> But I, I love this idea of talking it through, and it's kind of like, is it similar to like when you play, I mean, do you guys play pretend on the playground, you know, like yeah. those who, uh, you know, play well, on the playground? When, what I actually generally end up doing is something similar to that. We yeah. spent like nearly all of our recess for an entire year coming up with absolutely absurd things, haphazard instead of random. <laughs> haphazard. <laughs> Not random. This was this is another joke from our classroom. Is I was I was taken to task by a student that random is is different than haphazard. Yeah. Yes. Um, and we came up with an entire world which is really completely absurd. It's a flat planet that's shaped like a fractal. It's inhabited by various species, including these um, these fuzzy characters about the size of your head with feet the size of minivans. Um, <laughs> and one foot has their brain and the other has a stomach with an infinite capacity and the stomach controls them, basically. You remember, Caleb, when we did that thing in class where you kept interrupting me with the word mustaches and then I turned and I said, you know what, okay, today's assignment is gonna be do a story about why the mustache is the greatest thing in the entire world. And we just ran with it, and we just, and it turned out to be one of the most fun days. Of, to the point where another teacher came in and yelled at us for making so much noise because we were having too yeah. much fun drawing. Um, I, I have 30 pages of the mustache story <laughs> right in here. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I, I can't wait to look at it later. Uh, but what, what, what you both talked about that I think is really cool is, you know, people like to make a big fuss out of this writing thing. Like, oh, it's so hard and it's torture. And it is, right? It's hard work. But a lot of it boils down to just saying, like, wouldn't this be neat if? Right? Isn't that what you're doing when you're playing that game with Daniel, yes. right? Yeah, th this is cool. And then he says, yes, and, and he adds on to it. And you go, yes, and, and then it turns into an argument and you fight. But I, I don't know. I mean, and it's more of a, and when we do that, we're not, it's not just making a scene. It's making a story. Right. Our characters are the ones who argue, not us. That's the <laughs> point. We're not us anymore. We're somebody else. And that's what makes it so fun. Yeah, yeah, you get to you get to role play a little bit through the characters, right? And that's important if you want to actually, like you were talking about earlier, getting to know these characters. You have to inhabit them a little bit, don't you? You have to know your character, and it's very much easier if the character is part of yourself. Oh, as opposed to, like, do you think it'd be difficult to write something that was completely alien from you? Yes, unless it's a villain. If it's a villain, they you have to... It's ri the most difficult, I think, is to play a villain in a role-playing game because you have to find the meanest, nastiest piece of yourself and try to act on that, which may not make you feel great. <laughs> <laughs> it's one thing I am almost never the villain because I can't do that very well. 
But at the same time, at least you're doing that in a pretend environment rather than in real life. Because <laughs> I know my villains, my favorite villains are the ones who say and do all the terrible things I would love to do, but will not allow myself to do, you know? Exactly. Yes, so it's, it, it's, it's nicely, safely tucked away in this book where it won't hurt anybody, right? Uh, what, about, what about you, Olivia? Do you, do you do any kind of like, like, did you do pretend on the playground, like to come up with ideas, or not to come up with ideas, but did you do that? And if you did, did it affect your work in any way? Um, yeah, I did it a little, like sometimes, like during recess, we'd pretend there was a giant spider chasing us or something. Yeah, yeah. And I guess sometimes it affected, like when we'd pretend to be animals and like use the personalities that the animals would be or something like that kind of inspired me to do anthropomorphic or things that were like animals based on humans sort of like that okay so this kind of reminds me of something that Talia was talking about earlier about like looking at small things and saying I wonder what its perspective would be so you would look at the animal and say I wonder what kind of personality this animal would have right mm -hmm. so is does that I, I, I'm just trying to get under the hood of like where you get ideas for stories right and so when you, when you came up with um, hopelessly, hopelessly Clueless or Totally Clueless? Yeah, hopelessly. hopelessly. Uh, I mean, you, you mentioned that it came from, oh, well, I really like the way that these anthropomorphic animals look in this book. I'm going to write a story. Yeah, but that's, a, that's, that's the starting point. Like, how do you get to the action that's going to happen that you want to tell the story about? Like, how did you decide that it's going to be in a bank and she's going to be, you know, constantly almost killed by all these different random things? Yeah, well, I guess... Maybe it's from doodling a lot, <laughs> yeah. because I think one of during one of the comic classes I was sort of experimenting with a rabbit that was anthropomorphic with big eyes, and so then I moved on to the next doodle. I was like drawing like skeletons or something, so I'm like, hmm, what it would be like if this bunny was attacked by skeletons, and then I'm like, hmm, that'd be too weird. <laughs> So then I decided to do the story about the bunny almost dying lots of times, but being totally oblivious to it. Okay, so yeah, it just, it just came out of just throwing ideas down on a piece of paper and seeing yeah. what grabbed you and felt right. Going mm -hmm. back to something you said, it just feels right sometimes. Yeah. The deeper you can bury yourself in your own world, the better. A lot of people say, get out of your own world. Well, don't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what about um, this idea of originality? Like going back to this this idea of like you know writing from yourself. Uh, what about the people who say, "But you got to write something original. You have to write something brand new that's never been seen before." Do you guys worry about that? No, that's what? a silly idea. <laughs> Why? You you can't really make up new stuff. You're just going to be um, coming up with lots of ideas based on everything you've seen so far. But then that's you're just you, you're you're suggesting that we just copy everything around us. No, you mix lots of stuff together and make it so you like it. <laughs> I don't know, do, do you agree, Snow? Well, everybody's different and everyone likes different things. You take your favorite different ideas from different things and make something that's perfect for you. And since everyone's different, everyone's idea, idea of perfect is different. So therefore, you, there, let's just put it this way. The more original you try to be, the less it's going to be. Oh, why? Because when you are trying to make something original, you rack your mind for anything you haven't thought of, which is pretty much not possible. So you just kind of start coming up with the least obscure things that you didn't remember very well, which are usually the things you didn't like from movies, cartoons, people you met that were buried. And then as soon as you write it and get it on paper, you're like, I remember why I didn't remember this right off the bat. I didn't <laughs> like this. <laughs> So it also helps to be able to identify what you love. Is that, I mean, I guess that's part of like the writer's eye, after all. Okay, um, cool, well, man. I mean, you guys beat that one down fast. I thought I was going to get a little bit less resistance on this idea of originality or yeah, doing something totally original because that that is something that like older uh, artists struggle with a lot. They fight about it. You know, you got to do something original. Got to do something original. Forgetting that sometimes it's just the mixing and matching of things that you love, right? Uh, let me ask you guys this. Uh, you guys have, most of you have tabled at shows, sold your work at fairs and things. 
Um, this is a part of the gig, making comics, isn't it? And making anything, for that matter, is, is going and putting yourself on display and selling things. I wonder if you could share, share some, uh, here's where I ask your advice again. Uh, I, I finished a mini comic, good for me. Uh, and I'm pretty happy with it, and I'd like to try to sell it to people. Uh, what can I expect going to a show and trying to sell my work to the public? What's, what's that experience like? Who wants to speak to that? Natalia, do you want to kick, kick in on that? Because you, you tabled at Kids Read Comics 20, 2011 in Chelsea. What was that experience like, sitting behind a table all day? Well, I was excited because it was my very first one ever and my only one so far. <laughs> was that a hint? <laughs> 2012 is going to be uh, KRC's coming to Ann Arbor, so it won't be very much of a drive for you. We'll talk. Um. And I was really excited to show other people my comics because mainly my comics were only shown to some of my friends, my parents, and some other people I know. And it was a big chance for me to meet other cartoonists and um, to show other people my artwork, which I had really been wanting to do. My dream is to become um, a cartoonist and have tons and tons and tons of books. Yeah. What did Ryan Estrada say to you, though, when you said that, what does it take to be a real cartoonist? I don't exactly remember. <laughs> it was a while ago. <laughs> but if I remember right, he said, but you are a cartoonist. Because the moment that you finished and published your first book, you're a cartoonist, right? You sold books at the show. Doesn't that make you a pro? I don't know. Let's define that. Let's go there for a second. I mean. What do you guys think? Like printing and binding a book like that, doesn't that count as publishing? Or is there a different definition in some people's minds? What do you think? Well, I think that I guess it does count as publishing. It's like self publishing. It doesn't publishing doesn't mean it has to be like really popular and everybody has to know about it. it just has to mean means like that you've completed a book and it looks finished. Yeah. What do you say, Caleb? Uh, I think you're professional once you've made something and people come back and want more. Oh, that's a nice way to put it. So it doesn't, the number doesn't count. It's just a matter of, did people come back and say, could I see some more of that stuff or read another one? When are you going to do another one? I can't wait. Does that count? Once, once people are interested and are going to come back, then I think you're good. Like, for instance, when you read Dresden Kodak, you know, which is yeah. a very popular webcomic, but I asked the room and, it, and I said Dresden Kodak and I didn't get any knowing response like, oh yes, of course, right? It's, it's not something that's like widely known amongst everybody, but does that change any way about how you feel about it? Like, oh, I can't read this, it's not published by a publisher after yeah. all, right? I wish more people knew it so more people would get my t-shirts though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right, because yeah, you actually buy the Dresden Kodak t-shirts off of these websites. Right now. Oh, is that one of them? Yes. Oh, what does that represent? That it, it's um, some of Kim's cyborg logos. Oh, one of the characters. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Snow, you want to weigh in on this thing, this publishing thing? What Who it says you have to publish it on paper? If it's stored away, in, if you liked it enough, if you liked an idea enough to store it away in your memory banks, it's good enough for its publishing, isn't it? Because who says it won't get on paper later? No, oh, that's true. I mean, according to copyright law, it has to be in a fixed medium of some sort. But I mean, it I, is. I, yeah, it's in your brain. Yeah. You'll never forget it. Well, <laughs> you won't. Exactly. <laughs> Who says anyone else has to know? <laughs> okay. Well, I want to keep. I wanted to keep digging at this idea about what it's like the table. Uh, Olivia, could you weigh in on what it's like? I mean, what can people expect? What do you have to do when you're selling your work? Well, I think at least one person has to like it, <laughs> besides yourself. And maybe people like question about it, like what's going to happen next, or what are you going to do next to finish the book, or something like that. And yeah. But I'm, I'm talking about when you table that Kids Read Comics 2011. I mean, what's that experience like, and what did you do to prepare for that to sell your books to the public? Well, I made a lot of stuff. Like we did some silk screening, so I did some T-shirts. Do you have any of those here? I'm I, wearing I, one. Oh, are you wearing one right now? Did you stand up and show us what you printed? You printed it's, that? Yeah, it's one of my characters. His name's Wingnut, and he's a flying peanut. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. So okay, so you had merchandise. Yeah. You had posters. Yeah, I had a poster too. That that seems like a lot of work. Um. Yes, it was a lot <laughs> of work. 
but it was nice being prepared and seeing like how other artists like react to your different ideas and stuff like that. And and the general public too, watching people read your book and smile mm -hmm. when they did it. That is that that's gotta be a rewarding experience, right? Or yeah. It's a total stranger who's just like, Oh, what's this? Yeah. I wanna see this, right? It's really nice because then you can feel appreciated and all of your work can be paid off. Yeah. But you mentioned also meeting other cartoonists and seeing what they were re responding into your work. I want to go back to Natalia for a second. Natalia, you were talking about meeting all these different cartoonists. Is it important to you to be around other cartoonists when you're doing this stuff? How come? Well, uh, I really like to, um, like, when I've read their work, I really want to meet them themselves and ask them a few questions about it because I found it really amazing how they made all of it. Mm -hmm. Like, there's the Ellie McDoodle series, and I really, really, really like it. Oh, Ruth Barshaw. Yeah, she was at the show. Uh, RuthExpress.com is her website. She's, I think she's done some stuff at the Ann Arbor District Library before. Yes? No? I don't know. No. Well, if, if not, we'll have to get her here. Yeah. Well, I'll let you know if she comes to the library. But, but yeah, so meeting them to just talk about what it takes to do what they do, right? Talking shop and whatnot. And also... Um, when I meet new cartoonists, I can also decide um, if I want to read this new comic. Yeah. Also discovering new works, right? Is it th was it that way for you, Olivia? Did you get to talk to anybody who was tabling around you at the show? Yeah, I met this one guy. I can't remember his name. He did, I think, it was a comic about the Wolverine. What's his name again? Is it? About the Wolverine. Oh, yeah. are you talking about Joe Fu? Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I met him like more personally because his table was across from my, mine yeah and so um the first day um i really wanted somebody to draw me a picture of a panda so i went over and asked him and so he told me that he'd trade me a picture of a panda if i drew him a picture of his cartoon character so that was really fun super cool yeah, yeah joe's a great guy i think he's going to be at the ann arbor comics artist forum a uh, free monthly event that we put on here at the ann arbor district library what what date is that one Okay. So the first Sunday of next month, yeah, he will be here to uh, lead a little talk on what it takes to make comics. That's another thing that we do here at the Ann Arbor District Library is we put on a free monthly event where, Olivia, you show up to a lot of these, uh, just get to hang out and meet other cartoonists in the area and socialize, like what Natalia was talking about, get to talk shop with, with your peers, but also then bring in local experts to share their experiences and expertise to help the general public. So if, even if you're just somebody who's like, eh, I might want to make some comics, it's a great resource that's absolutely for free, and it's a two-hour event, 1 to 3 p.m., and it's downtown, the downtown multi-purpose room. So a little plug for that while we're on the subject. But, uh, but yeah, Joe Fu is a super cool guy. And, that, and that's cool, too, because, I mean, you're, you're one of us then, right? Yeah. He didn't like say, like, what, you want a drawing? Five dollars, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said, no, I want you to draw me something, too, because you're there on the same level playing field. That's mm -hmm. going to be pretty empowering, right? Yeah. Yeah, and then you wind up seeing these people year after year. Uh, Kind of cool. So, Snow, you've you've tabled at the uh, the art fair. Kids art fair. Kids art fair. Okay. Well, there aren't really any experts there, so I don't know about meeting people who are more experienced in your profession. I I just know that people love handmade stuff. They absolutely love it when they can go and see your work and see who made it. They absolutely love that. What really makes it fun for them too, and what really keeps makes them interested is if you have a, stack, a pile of comic books on your table and they're just like, are you the guy who made this or are you the one who just printed it and they're putting it on the table? I think it's important to have be something you're working on there, something you can scratch on whenever no one's asking about your stuff. That's a nice, subtle way to say, yes, I'm an artist, right? And plus you're getting work done. Mm -hmm. you, you were working on your pages before we, just, just before we started reco uh, recording the show today. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it does double duty there. So okay, so that's some advice you'd give is, is yeah. bring work so that you can clearly state that you are an artist. Yeah. Okay, we're going to open it up to questions if anybody has any questions. And Sharon will be uh, walking around with the microphone if anybody wants to ask our panel of experts some, uh, something that's burning in their mind. Uh, but I want to take the last five minutes before we do that to offer any closing thoughts from you guys. 
any last thing that you want to let people know about yourselves or your work or you know just a general takeaway of your experience so far making comics and telling stories visually, we should say. Want me to just call on you? Oh, Natalia, you want to go? Go. Um, when I was talking about my comics, one of them got missed. <laughs> <laughs> like, Do it. Go for it. This is uh, one called Crumb. And it's about, it's sort of like Blob, so little fuzzy dude, and it shows his perspective of an adventure. His adventure is trying to get from the upstairs to the kitchen. That's his sort of adventure. <laughs> Plus his tongue is twice as large as him. That would make it difficult to get to the kitchen, I would think. Well, he manages to keep it in his mouth. In oh, this okay. last panel here, it shows how big his tongue is. My, I really like the, the third, the cover of volume three. It shows Crumb it in the car. Can you hold it up? Do you have it here? No. Oh. <laughs> I'm on like page two. Oh. It shows Crumb in a car sticking his head out the window, I think with his tongue out. The car is going about one, mi one million miles an hour, and Crumb's owner is yelling at the top of her lungs, get back in the car right now! Because if Crumb's not careful, he's just gonna get thrown out of the car somewhere on the highway. Natalia, I noticed you do that really well. You do the voices of your characters really well. Uh, do, you, do you talk to yourself like that when you're drawing the characters? Do you do the voices of your characters as you're writing the dialogue? Well, sometimes I make, like if I draw their face expressions, for some reason I have this automatic reaction and I do the same expressions. Yeah, I do the same thing. <laughs> sometimes it drives me crazy. Because <laughs> you're lost in the role. This is going back to something Snow said. You get lost in that character, don't you? And you're, you're busy being that character on the page. So, I mean, this is one of the neat things about comics is that you get to be the writer, the script writer, the director, and every actor on the stage, right? You're in complete control, but it also means that you get a little, little kooky when you're making your comics, right? Um, about <laughs> the thing where we are, like, doing the things at recess. Yeah. Um, it's a coincidence because before me and Emily really went out to enjoy our recess, Emily's my friend and she's also totally hooked up with cartooning. Um, we both know about the Warrior Cat series, and we have two cats that we really like. We were imagining what it would be like if we could have a story about just them, and we thought up some pretty crazy ideas to make the story adventurous. Like, they were secret sister and brother, oh, and no one else knew except them. Oh, neat. So we were thinking about actually making it, because me and Emily have made several comics together. Uh, aftercare or somewhere at recess. Oh, so you're going to make some fan comics based on the talking games that you play, the pretend on the playground. Yeah. yeah, and we're making this board game right now, and it also includes cartooning. In the rule book, it has several different um, characters, and Emily drew them out, and they were all manga or anime. Hmm. So basically, whatever drawing I do, there's some sort of cartooning involved in it. And um, me and Emily play, we're basically making a story by ourselves. Our minds work like a movie, because I can imagine it <coughs> on a story or a movie when we play it, even though there's some pretty crazy things happening. Let me ask you guys, actually, that's a really interesting point. You said, you, you know, your, your mind is like a movie playing out the scenes in your head. Is it, is it that way for all you guys? Yeah. It's very yeah. important to be able to freeze frame the movie oh. to get the right movement. And get the right movement, capture the right moment. Same with you, Caleb? Yeah. Uh, I find myself, like, go getting into p poses so I can draw stuff right a lot. Let me ask the panel this. And you can plead the Fifth Amendment. If you don't know what that means, that means you don't have to admit something that might get you into trouble. Uh, who here has ever gotten in trouble in class for being daydreamy or doodling on paper or, hey, get back on task, kid, quit goofing around? Yeah? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, had my, I had my parents called into the, to talk to the teachers many times because of that. Uh, but it's because you get caught up in this, don't you? You know, you get lost in it. So. 
Well, I can't concentrate unless I'm drawing on something, so that gets me out of a lot of trouble, especially because I'm homeschooled and my mom lets me do that. Oh, it helps if you have understanding parents too, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, okay, last question, and then we'll turn it over to the floor, see if you guys have any questions for these guys. Uh, favorite tool right now, favorite drawing tool that you're using that you could recommend somebody try out today? Because like Olivia, you were talking about the brush pen. You want to talk about that a little bit more? Uh, I don't know what exactly I'd say. Like, um, like what, well, if I've, I've never used it before. I'm the guy <laughs> on the street, I'm like, brush pen, whatever. I'm just going to use a ballpoint. Why would I want to use that dumb thing? Well, I, I also like it because you don't have to keep switching out pens for different thicknesses because you can just change it by how much pressure you're putting on your hand. Why would I need to use different thicknesses? Like if, weird idea. if you're doing something like a really like if you're inking a cartoon and you want something to be black, you can just press a little harder and it'll have a broader line. Okay. And then I would use thinner lines for what? Like if you're doing very small details like fur or grass or somebody's hair or something like that and you want it to look sort of real, you can sort of use the dry brush effect where not all the ink comes out so it makes it look a little like ruffled. Cool. So how much is this going to set me back, this tool? Um, $7.49. Oh my gosh, forget it. No, that's too expensive. <laughs> 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 no, actually I agree with you 100%. I think it's totally an awesome pen. But it does take some practice, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it does become naturally easy. What, what would you recommend, Snow? Is there any like drawing tool or supply right now that you just could not live without? Drawing, I've only ever used a pencil. I can't stand inking with a pen just because I'm afraid I'll ruin my stuff. But I, one thing that's really essential is rulers. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Drawing straight lines are really important, especially with backgrounds. Any special one that you like? Um, or just like, again, plastic, metal, doesn't matter as long as plastic, it's straight? Plastic and clear, so you can line it up really well with another line. Okay, because yeah, you should hold this up again so people can see one more time that you were using the ruler a lot on this page with this scene of endless lockers and you probably needed to see through your ruler to get all your perspective lines right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what that tool is called. It's a triangle. It's used for keeping lines directly straight to one another. I wish I knew. Oh, parallel and perpendicular? Yeah, I wish I knew where that one is. I know we have one. Where is it? <laughs> it's actually just called an artist triangle. There's no fancy word for it that I know. But yeah, yeah they, they, they have, you can get them at any art store, usually the plastic usually, right? Yeah. What about you, Natalia? What's one of your favorite drawing supplies right now? It's basically just the pen. I can, <laughs> be, I can be really picky when it comes to pens. Like, I have some special pens at home, and I just like drawing black and white comics. Because coloring for me just takes too much time and drives me up the wall. <laughs> These special pens, if I only use them if I can see that they have enough ink. If they don't have enough ink, I throw it back in my desk and try to find a new one. I make sure that it always has enough ink, and it, I don't think this has enough, actually. Oh, no. So you like something where you actually can see the ink cartridge in there, or the ink well, or whatever, right? But is that just like a ballpoint pen otherwise? Okay, I do that. <laughs> <laughs> is that just a regular ballpoint pen otherwise, except for the fact that it like, has a clear chamber? Okay. Well, we can look at it closer. Here, pass it to me. Let me see. The, um, this isn't one of the pens, though. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> They're at home. <laughs> but you like to work in ink, is what you're saying. And that's interesting. That, that's another thing to point out, is the sense of dis or different dispositions in artists, where there's some artists who prefer the pencil, some prefer pens, right? And for the longest time, I wouldn't touch a brush with a 10-foot pole. I, was, I would fight people on it, and now I'm addicted to that brush pen, so. Caleb, you got something? Um, I, most, I, I mostly use pencils. I do use the brush pen, but I have not practiced enough with it yet. Um, but I prefer to use a mechanical pencil, because as I go along with a regular pencil, it um, starts getting duller and the art degrades. Right, you had to keep sharpening it. Mechanical pencils stay sharper, easier. You also use digital tools. I mean, you were sharing with me, one of the things I thought was just amazing is that when you sent me a, a three-dimensional, three-dimensionally rendered computer map of the environment that you're going to tell a story about. And what did you use to do that with? Blender. 
Um, the nice thing is it's free, and it's a, it's basically the same quality as two or three thousand dollar software. And what what is what does it do? I mean, it's like a it's a drawing program, but general purpose three D modeling. So you can just you can make basically anything. <laughs> I use it for a lot of things, like animating, um, and it's also good for special effects because it can do various physics simulations. And so you're actually using it to develop the map or the uh, three-dimensional model of the city that your story is going to take place in? Because there are tons and tons of buildings, and it would be really hard to get right otherwise. Right, yeah, it's a reference tool for you if you're building a fantasy world, right? So it's yeah. called Blender and it's totally free. That's pretty cool. Okay, uh, let's open it up for questions. If anybody has any questions for this panel, uh, we'll be glad to entertain them. You have four really smart cartoonists sitting in front of you, uh, full of wisdom, ready to just scream it at you. Hello? <laughs> so you don't believe Blender is cheating? Hmm? Because you're not using your mind to determine shapes and structures. You're creating an object. Therefore, I know we all use models, but so you don't think that that yeah. takes from actually um, using your mind to come up with those same ideas well, and features and dimensions? Well, I, so what I did is I did draw out a map of the whole city first. And then I do have to build everything up from scratch, even in Blender. I make the cubes and have to stretch them and put them exactly where I want. And then I'm going to draw over it again and just need to make sure I don't skip 50 buildings. <laughs> <laughs> so, But then you can actually rotate it and change views for different stories that take part in different places in your city. Yeah. So, uh, no, Blender's a lot of work too, so I, yeah. I understand that in itself is an art form. Yeah. But you don't feel bad actually creating it and then actually then taking frames from that and then drawing them yourself. Yeah, I'm, no. I'm basically just using it to make sure I do not, um, making sure it's possible to draw and doesn't take 100, 100 hours per page. Digital art is still art. Yes. Thanks for that. Yeah, did you have a thought on that, Snow? You were looking at me very knowingly like, oh, I got something. Every time I do Blender, he tells me, I mean, every time I draw a picture, he says, do it in Blender. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you know, it, it, as long as you're building the thing, you know, it's going to make your life a lot easier, especially with some of these evil perspective panels that you're looking in, in the eye right now. It's so much easier to draw it <laughs> than to do it in Blender. <laughs> well, that's the other thing, too, is that not every tool works for everybody, right? So if you don't have a natural inclination for Blender, then don't. I can't yeah. stand it. Like <laughs> that, that hallway, um, once you've spent about 10 hours working with Blender and know how to use it, you could probably build it in a minute or two just by making one cube and then making an array of it. Yeah, just repeating just it. Just tell it to array. But let me, let me ask you this. Um, don't you find that sometimes getting lost in a drawing like that is its own like has its own kind of pleasurable experience. Like I find, see, okay, I'll, I'm, I'll be the first to admit, I've used computer-assisted drawing in my, in my work. Uh, my, my graphic novel starts with a shot of a Ferris wheel in three-point perspective. I tried drawing this, folks. It would have taken the rest of my life before I would have gotten it right. And I thought, I just want to get the darn book done. So I built the, the Ferris wheel in a uh, CAD program, printed it out in blue, inked it myself. But then there's other shots where I was doing, you know, hallway scenes like what you got, Snow. And there's something kind of like meditative sometimes, isn't there? Like just repeating line after line and just getting lost in the drawing and not really thinking about it too hard. Just the mechanical process can sometimes, I don't know, is it that way for you? Well, well, how I do a comic is I pretty much see it and build it. Yeah. I know what I want and it's just whether or not I can get what I want on paper. <laughs> like, yeah, you just, you just highlighted the real trouble of it. It was having a vision and trying to capture that vision, right? Does anybody else have any questions? Yeah.
it's a challenge, and so I think it's probably just fun to take on that challenge and see if you can do it. I know that when Snow made that hallway, she's like, look what I did, you know, after she had spent so much time on it. It really looks like a hallway. Look, it's perspective, you know, look, it's accurate. So yeah. um, I think that's, that's just really rewarding to really stick to it and see how it comes out. Oh, definitely. I would, I would totally agree with that, and I bet you guys would agree too. How many, yeah. how many here play sports on the panel? One of you? Okay. Uh, do you, I'll ask you, Olivia, since you play sports and make comics, do you ever find yourself being kind of competitive with your, with your art the same way you are in sports? Um, not as competitive. Because <laughs> usually, well, in school sports, you're always playing, you, like in seventh and eighth grade, you usually play multiple times against each team. And so you get kind of like, oh, I want to beat them again or something like that. Okay. Uh, it, but it, where I was going with it is that sometimes with my cartoonist buddies, when I do a really good job on something, I'll do the whole in your face, you know, like hold it up to them and be like, yeah, you've been served and I'm the best and you're not now. And then they come back to me with something really awesome and then I feel rotten and then I got to beat them again. It, it, I, I was wondering if it was like that at all, but I don't know, maybe you don't... Uh, compete with your cartoonist buddies like the way I do, like a stupid muscle-headed jock? Well, um, sometimes like some kids at my school, they're also interested in drawing and stuff like that. So we do, we do drawings like more of sort of just one page, like just drawing something like a car or a person doing a certain pose, and then we try to like see who's the best or something. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else have any other uh, thoughts, questions, wonderings? Can be something, it doesn't have to be fully formed as a question. I can translate it if it's just a general wondering. Like, what about the color red? That's weird. <laughs> Natalia, I was wondering what would happen if you mixed crumb and uh, blob. What would happen if they met? Well, first, crumb would probably think blob is a giant pizza. Crumb would start chasing after blob like crazy. Eventually, Blob would let Crumb get him, run right through him, and then a friendship would start somehow. And I might mix those together because they're both small and like doing very weird things. Awesome. So you just, you just came up with another story just like that. You just showed us how easy it is to do this. Wow, super cool. Okay, we got enough time for maybe one more. What was your inspiration for your comics? Oh, good. Inspiration for the comics that you're working on right now, or the latest one that you did. Uh, we'll start at, at Caleb's end and work our way this way. Um, I basically started with Rainbow Buddies and tried to think of something that I would actually be interested in doing. And um, You mean the Rainbow Buddies didn't sound like a story idea that you were like, oh man, I can't wait to do that one. Well, I wanted to come up with a specific thing I was yeah. interested in doing. <laughs> so <laughs> what inspired it? Anything? Uh, I don't know. I basically just tried sticking random things together. And um, slowly once I had a... Um, once I had gotten to some point, I could start building out for what made sense, what made sense with the story, and I stole a lot of people's ideas that they came up with. <laughs> you mean the ideas that other people came up with in other books, or ideas that other people said in class as you were, oh, <laughs> as they were saying in class? That, that's, one, that's one of the cool things about working with friends, though, is that you get the collaborative ideas. One of the things that I think is really astonishing about the class that we're doing right now with the, the Rainbow Buddies thing is how you guys are all chatting amongst yourselves while you're working and freely offering insights and ideas. And, hey, you should try this. And you should try that. Da Daniel talks up a storm in class while he's drawing, giving everybody free ideas to put in their stories. And I think that's super cool. That's yeah. one of the things that happens when you have art buddies, right? Yeah. Uh one of the main reasons I still take the class is because there are all the people having really fun discussions. Yeah, oh, super cool. So that's, that's where inspiration come from, it's just from a discussion with a friend. Natalia, inspiration? What, what, where's the inspiration for Blob? Blob? Uh, I think I said it already. Did you? But that computer game. Oh, that's right, you did. You said the computer game. Just green, but there's something about Blob I didn't mention yet. Get in the tight on the mic so we can hear it. 
Um, I'm going to make Blob full color comics and black and white comics. The cool thing about Blob in the full color comics, with his, as his mood changes, so does his color. He's usually a blue blob. If he's happy, he turns green. If he doesn't feel well, he'll turn orangish red. <laughs> and so on. You've also shown me that you get a lot of <coughs> ideas from YouTube videos too, right? Annoying Orange? <laughs> yeah, that Annoying Orange video that you made me watch like 20 times. What happens in that one? I don't remember which one that was. Oh, it was the Pokemon battle one. Oh yeah, Wild and Annoying Orange appeared. That was funny. <laughs> so you, you get a lot of joke ideas or maybe inspiration or you know just a general sense of like enthusiasm from watching YouTube too, right? Yeah, like the, the duck song was another one that we were watching uh, in class when we shouldn't have been. So yeah. So okay, uh, let's hear from you, Olivia. Inspiration. Well, um, we haven't really created uh, the comic yet, but me and my friend, we both really, really like um, Rick Riordan's uh, Greek mythology series. Mm. And so um, we were wondering what it would be like if uh, there were these two twins who were the daughters of a titan and a Greek god because they really fight a lot. So we were kind of trying to come up with names, so we got inspired by Greek. Greek mythology and his books. Oh, cool. So even, even crusty old things like Greek mythology can be sources of inspiration for yeah. new projects. Shiny awesome. old things. No? Well, I pretty much jammed an idea which I already had and made it fit the idea of Rainbow Buddies. I always I already had most of the characters. Hale and Pyra, Hale I dug out of the old box of ideas. Pyra is a completely brand new character. So I have an array, a place, several different characters, and the two of, and um, two characters that make it very original, mm -hmm. even in my own mind, because I've never written a comic before. So do you hang on to every idea you come up with in case it might be useful later? Pretty much. Yeah, so you, being an idea hoarder probably <laughs> helps a lot. <laughs> Of course, whenever you play, whenever I play adventure games with Daniel, there's always the occasional backstory. Yeah, yeah, come up and come up with a backstory that will, yeah, just pocket it for now. Well, gosh, guys, thank you so much for sharing all these awesome insights. So one more time, I'm gonna uh, sound everybody's name. Oh, we have one more question. Oh, sure. Um, um, how do you feel when? Say you read a book and you come across something that you are planning on doing or were or are doing, and the person that wrote it or drew it did um, they did it, and you feel like they did it ten times better than you could ever do, even if you became as good as you wanted to be. Interesting question. Where's the courage to take that one on? Mm, I don't know. I think I would still want to do it as long as it wasn't really 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 close like if it was like uh oh i had this idea about this little mouse who lives with some people his name is Stuart little and he has some adventures with a cat and then oh no right like that that would be like good enough to make you say no i'm not going to do it now yeah. okay <laughs> but what what i mean like would you what if it was like uh oh i got this idea about a whale hunter and he's on a boat and he's going after this whale and he's really really hung up on it and then all of a sudden you find out about Moby Dick. Would you still go ahead with it? Mm, if it if it was a different story, yeah. yes. Like, what do you mean by story, though? That's well, a, that's a tricky word. If the is the story uh, the stuff that happens, or is the story what the meaning is? Is what my question is. That that's my deep question of the day. This is the kind of stuff we talk about in comics class. <laughs> I don't know. What do you guys think? I think it's a mixture of the two. You can't have the meaning of the story without the story, and you can't have the story without the meaning of the story. So it's pretty much the same thing, or very similar. Well, now we're on to another thing. I can't just, well, they're both part of each other. They're not yeah. the same thing, but they're part of each other. OK. OK, so then if you take Melville's Moby Dick, which is a story about what, man <coughs> versus nature, uh, also about revenge, being consumed about, by revenge. What would, what could you change, in order to make your whale hunter story, your own, and still get to tell your whale hunter story? 
Well, like, instead of, I would put a new twist on it. Like, instead of man versus nature, I'd change it to man versus self or something. Like, having him battling conflict and changing the point of view or maybe taking out some of the characters and putting in new ones. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Even, like, even moving it to modern day would change it. That's enough. true. <laughs> He's hunting a whale in space. <laughs> space whales. <laughs> that always works. Just say in space after your idea, and it's usually pretty good. No, but it's, this is, I mean, th in all seriousness, you guys all said early on that originality isn't something that you necessarily have to be striving for, right? So, yeah. I don't know, did that answer your question at all? Okay. All right, well, we're already over time, and that is so awesome that we went over time because that means that we're having a really good conversation. So I want to introduce everybody one more time. We've got to give them a round of applause because you guys are so great to get to lend your time to share your expertise. So we have Snow, we have Olivia, Natalia, and Caleb. Let's go and give them a round of applause. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>